Hi everyone, welcome to my Forever Young interview series where in my hot seat today I have Dr. Deanna Minnick and she is a wealth of information. I've got a very brilliant young lady in front of us today that's going to help us live a life full of vitality is the key word for today. She's the author of five books. Many of them are on spirituality and food and how to be vital. So hi Dr. Minnick, how are you today? Hello, thank you for having me. Awesome, we're so happy to have you. Oh, well, it's, it's my pleasure, and it's so fascinating to have this topic to discuss, so I'm excited to see what's in his mouth. Exactly. Well, you have a wealth of information to share with us. I was looking through your credentials, and what led you to this journey, this type of profession? You know, I think it goes back really far uh, into my childhood. Uh, so my mother was very health conscious. And so growing up in the 1970s and having a health nut mom was not really a cool thing. But uh, she was really that messenger for me. So I was kind of different. I was eating different foods, doing different things. I'd come home from school and my mom was watching Richard Simmons. And so um, I think from a very young age, I was almost repulsed by all of it. I, I didn't care about this whole health movement. And then something clicked for me, I would say after I went through high school, then I had to start thinking about what I'm gonna do with my life. And I found that I was really drawn towards science and I was also drawn towards holistic therapies. I thought I was gonna be a medical doctor and I was on that path. And so um, as I was having to make the decision about whether or not to take the MCAT, it finally hit me that I just couldn't do it, that I wanted something preventative, and I didn't want to have just a pill for an ill, just writing prescriptions all my life. So I changed course um, immediately, and I decided to go into nutrition, something I never thought I would get into, especially because I was just turning out my nose at anything nutrition for so many years. And I was a binge eater, I was an overeater, I went through a lot of issues as it related to food and eating. So I also, at that time, while I was going through my study with science, had taken my first yoga class and I really liked it. And I thought, you know, there's something here that I need to go deeper into. So the whole time that I was growing up and in my 20s, really focusing on science and spirituality. And I felt like the two really needed to be braided together, that they seemed like a real natural fit. So here I am now in my 40s and um, doing just that, braiding together science and spirituality and all that I do into a whole training and certification and education called Food and Spirit, where we look at food, we look at the physical, and we also look at the soul and how do the two come together. Oh, two of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. They do relate. I mean, it's not just black and white, you know, there's so much more to it than that. So tell me, how do you stay so radiant as you are? <laughs> well, I, I think one of the things that can really chisel away at our radiance is stress. And you might have expected me to say food, and I would say that is number two. Um, but really stress can get a hold of us and it can age us beyond our years. And so that's something that I, probably that's the biggest challenge and the opportunity for me is with all the things happening in my life, how do I keep every step of the way in balance? And that's not easy. So if I seem radiant, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of things going on. And I think that's the first thing that I find with a lot of patients, a lot of clients that come to me. They're stressed beyond their wildest dream. And for the most part, people know how to eat. You know, you kind of know what's good for you and you know what's not so good for you. But when we're in those situations where we have a lot of stress, we begin to make decisions that may not be the best suiting for who we are. So I would say, you know, it really boils down to, you know, what is balance? I think that that's also a very generic term. Balance is different for everybody. And what you can handle might be different than what I can handle. We might become more resilient just by going through trial and error, different things. But as we get older, what the studies show is that we actually have less propensity to deal with stress. Our brain is not as plastic, so we have to work at it. We have to work at dealing with stress. So there are all different types of modalities, you know, meditation, exercise, just exercising three hours a week just from moderate walking can increase the gray matter of your brain uh, significantly. And that's a good thing because as we get older, the brain shrinks. 
you know, imagine it like clay and it just starts to dehydrate, you know, just in a very simple term. And then we don't get that plasticity. We don't get that mobility. So in essence, you know, when we lose the flow, we start to age. Oh, that's uh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's empowering. You know, I, I think if we know what it takes, um, it's just how do we stay within the flow? Flow is really key, um, whether it's brain flow, heart flow, and gut flow. Those are the three major body systems, and they all talk to one another. So if we're flowing in between, and that's why things like omega-3 fats are so important, because they help us to establish flow, communication from one system to the next. The moment we jam up and we have things like stagnation and stasis, and this is well recognized in traditional medicine, right? That's why we go for acupuncture, to help the chi flow. The moment we don't have the chi flowing, the vital force within us flowing, we become full of pain. We might have uh, no function, no mobility. So flow is my key word. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I want to take us back to our favorite V word of the day. What is vitality? Some people have heard of it and don't know what it means. So what's your description of vitality? You know it when you see it. So a vital person to me is somebody like you. I can look at their eyes. They're clear. Um, white sclera, clear eyes rather than um, broken bloodshot vessel eyes, right? Eyes are one of the first places I look because the eyes represent the liver. They also, in some traditions, represent, um, gosh, our sense of clarity, our sense of soul. I also look at the skin. How healthy and radiant is the skin? Is the skin lackluster and pale? Or is it glowing? I think, you know, it's so interesting to me that women put on so much powder and so much makeup on their face to really reduce the glow. I think we should do just the opposite. I think we should be shiny, happy people and allow our glow to come forth because what, you know, why would we dampen that down? Um, also looking at hair, looking at hair quality, um, you know, thickness as, it, as we get older, things start to change, hair color. Um, the strength of our hair. Um, it, it's really the joie de vie. It, it's the, the sense of getting that sensation that we just want to get out of bed in the morning because we have that sense of purpose, that sense of joy and passion for life. So it's not all physical things. Some people may not look, you know, they may have wrinkles, and but they have that sense of presence. And the moment that they walk into a room, you can just tell that they are overflowing with chi. And vitality to me is when somebody is connected, they're aware, they're grounded, they're in the present moment, um, they have great functionality, they're vibrant, they're communicative, and um, really creative. Again, they, they are people that are in the flow. And so many physical ways to tell that, as well as emotional ways, and even mental ways. People that can think quickly, that can process thoughts. You know, it's really looking at the whole body, the whole self. They're alive. They're truly plugged in. <laughs> They're electric. Yes. And I think, you know, Carrie, this whole thing of um, looking at anti-aging, you know, this word gets tossed out a lot. And it really, I don't know, it just kind of deflates me a bit. I don't really connect to that word anti, anti-aging. Uh, I feel like it's a double negative. So that's why I like this V word of vitality. Because how often do we go to the physician not to just release us from symptoms and from disease, but really to become vital. Wouldn't it be great if we went to the doctor for more vitality? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we get vitality just from the everyday life that we have? You know, what are the nutrients we need? What are the activity patterns? And studies show, as you know, that um, our lifestyle and our food determine so much about how we age. And really, we don't know unless we have an identical twin, right? Right. We don't know. My dad happens to be an identical twin, and I just have to tell you this story. So my dad, his name is John, and his brother's name is Jim. And then when they were growing up, they looked so identical that nobody could tell them apart. Even their mother had a very difficult time. They went to high school. They looked so alike that they could switch classes. So my uncle was really good at science and math, and my dad was better at reading and literature, you know, the right brain and the left brain. So they would switch classes. They would even switch dates. Oh they gosh. looked so similar that people could not tell them apart. So then my uncle went into um, becoming an engineer, becoming having his desk job, working a lot in the mind. And my dad was um, a police officer and worked a lot more in his body. Uh, so he was he had a lot more stress. They both had the same amount of kids. They both had three kids. 
But my, now looking at them in their 60s, they look quite different because they've had a number of different life experiences that shaped them and molded them. This is epigenetics. And you're, you, I'm sure that you've heard this from your other uh, speakers as well about the power of epigenetics, what we do to our genome. But we don't always get to see what we would have turned out as if we made other decisions, right? So, but I happen to see that firsthand just with my, my father and my uncle, their different lifestyles and what that has cultivated. I love that story. I have twin nephews. I'm going to watch them closely now. <laughs> Take picture. <yes. laughs> they're 16 and I'm going to, and I'm going to tease them if they're switching dates or classes. Cause it is true. One's a left brain. One's a right brain. Totally. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And they're so identical. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had a twin, that's an interesting perspective, you know, of, yeah. of what path they would have went down if they chose smoking or, yeah. you know, a lot of drugs and alcohol kind of abuse. And what they would look like, you know, versus the path I chose, <laughs> which is absent of that. So very interesting. So is there such thing as really not aging or slowing down the aging process besides stress? And you mentioned that, and that's a huge one. And I just want to go back for a second on that. Um, you mentioned maybe handling what one person can handle is, is hard and versus another person makes it look almost effortless to be easy on ourselves. We do have set these standards so high, especially as moms or busy wives, that we think, oh, well, she's doing it, I can do it, what's wrong with me? And we do kind of kind of have a race involved with um, standard of living to just be gentle with ourselves instead of tackling more than we can. So that's a key to not be so stressed, to be gentle with yourself. But more importantly, is there a way to really slow down the aging process besides knocking out stress? <laughs> Well, first of all, let me just say that we're all going to age. There's no way to really stop the process. We can only do it in an optimal way as best we can, right? So I don't want to set forth any false notions that we can retain the, the fountain of youth. And um, what, what's that? The story of Dorian Gray, right? Where, you know, we become ageless. That's not possible. Uh, but I have seen some people age very gracefully. And if I observe them and I look at the science of what I'm familiar with as it relates to this whole body of literature, there are, I mean, let's start with nutrition. There are certain things we can do to preserve our DNA. One of the factors of aging is DNA damage. So the more that we're creating breaks in our DNA, whether it's through ultraviolet radiation, whether it's through um, poor diet, certain things come in. I mean, food talks to our genes. So if we have littered messages, messages of overeating, over uh, inundating, when we eat too much, this can age us. In fact, that's pretty well known that we over stimulate and over inundate the mitochondria, causing the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell to die. So through food alone, we can determine our fate to some great extent. So the quality of those foods and then also the quantity. In fact, um, I've been talking with some other experts about just even the role of fasting. And there are all different ways to fast. And it seems that the one that is most beneficial, whether it's you know a day-long fast or a week-long fast or a weekend fast, one thing that I think everybody can do for the most part, although they'll have to check with their practitioners to be sure that you know the medications they're taking, their blood sugar, you know, these types of things can be tracked and followed and it's good for them. But it's a 12-hour fast. We go to bed at maybe well, we stop eating at like 7 p.m. And then we don't eat again until the next morning at 7 a.m. Right there, you've got 12 hours. And then you give your mitochondria a breather. You allow the body to cleanse properly and to detoxify because otherwise, there's no break. And I don't know how we got this idea, but I think in nutrition, we developed this idea that we needed to eat every three to four hours. Don't let your blood sugar drop. You need to eat every three to four hours. Well, I think that that got us a little bit in trouble. Because what were we eating? How much were we eating? We were eating more food than we probably needed. And so we weren't really listening to our bodies. We were just looking at the clock. So I think that doing this 12, and in some cases, some uh, practitioners like to do a 14 to 16 hour fast. I think that that's a little bit long for some people. But I think that the 12 hour is completely doable. I mean, gosh, uh, you know, for many years, people talked about not eating three hours before bedtime. So if the average bedtime is 10 o'clock, let's just take that as an average, then at 7 o'clock, then again, you know, not waking up until about 6, 6.30, and then not eating until about 7. It, it all kind of works out with the, the correct bio rhythm. 
I like that. I'm a, a late morning breakfast person, so I think I hit the 12 mark every time, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those that forces myself to eat breakfast in the morning. I know I need the fuel. Come on, Carrie, do it. So yes, that's that good. Is. So you're giving your body a break, which is good. I never thought of it quite that way. That's a really good inside tip. Well, maybe for somebody like you, you could do a 16 hour. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not a person that needs, you know, that's another one of those tenets in nutrition where it was like, eat your breakfast. And yeah, the studies on breakfast are pretty compelling that if we eat breakfast, then our metabolism is a little bit more regulated. But I still think everything needs to be personalized. And nutrition is dangerous because we get into these beliefs that can be very limiting. And then it's like, well, how did I start doing that? Well, that was something that was, you know, cultivated in the media or, you know, and so just listening to our bodies is also one of the ways to age gracefully. Just seeing where we're at and being aware, being in tune. Right. Cater it for you, for sure. So I like the term age gracefully, which I fully believe in. Um, my mom is 70 years old and doesn't look a day over 55. And I say it's, and of course, having a health nut for a daughter has helped her <laughs> tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> to brainwash her. But, um, but way before I even got into natural health, I think what has kept my mom young at heart is her true heart. I mean, mm -hmm. she laughs, she's joyful. She loves her grandkids and gets down and plays with them all the time. So being a child at heart, I think is helpful too. So when I think of aging gracefully, I think of my mom, which is kind of cool. So I hope to strive to be like that. What other tips are good for aging gracefully? Well, let me talk more about the food. If I just talked in general about the quality of food, but I didn't really give your uh, listeners any ideas as to what I meant by that. So the way I think about food is I think about the macronutrients, the three musketeers, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And then I think about the kind of the underdogs, the minerals, vitamins, and phytonutrients. So I'll just kind of run through those quickly and just give you like one or two tips based on that pinwheel. Um, when it comes to protein, I think that that's really important as we get older because what happens as we age is we get fatty muscle. So when our muscle becomes fatty, it can't respond to insulin, which means it can't respond to blood sugar. We can't process. And so we just get more and more fat. So one of the things that helps us to keep and preserve our muscle integrity is whey protein. In fact, there are a number of studies looking at whey protein because it has certain amino acids or the building blocks of protein that allow us to preserve our muscle, even with aging. And as we get older, what happens is a process called inflammaging. It's all one word. It's inflammation and aging all together. And this is the very subtle chronic aging process that happens because we're inflamed. And many times we don't even know that we're inflamed. Our muscle might be inflamed and we have no idea. So what the whey protein does is it helps to normalize that a bit. So do you do whey protein? Is that something, I know that you're big into fitness and I'm sure that whey protein might be part of what you're familiar with, right? Yes, I'm a smoothie junkie and there's always whey in my smoothies. <laughs> this reminded me I need to get more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's first and foremost. And also whey protein gives us um, a lot of the precursors for what we call glutathione. And glutathione is, I call it the mother if you don't have the mother protecting you uh, from all of the stress in your environment, then you just degrade your body. You degrade a lot of the systems. You don't have that protection. So whey protein is giving us a number of different things. It's a gift for our muscles and also protection just as an antioxidant defense. So I really like it. And even people that are sensitive to milk products tend to tolerate whey better um, because it also stimulates and modulates the immune system. And that's one of the first systems to decline with aging. We start getting colds and flus more often. We just don't have good defenses. We start breaking down faster. So on those three accounts, whey protein would be a good choice. So that's the P for, for protein. The F for fat, um, if I think about fat, um, you know, fat is not as bad as we think it might be if people still have that outdated idea in their minds that was really cultivated in the 1990s when we had all those fat-free foods like snack wells and gosh I remember them all it was like no more fat and I think that that really did us in because that meant more sugar mm -hmm. uh, what we're now learning is that fat doesn't necessarily make us fat we may actually need fat to keep a normal healthy body composition 
So what I like to look at is a blend, a blend of different quality fats, omega-3s, which we know are the squiggly fluid fats that we don't have too much of uh, for, mo for the most part. Then there's also the omega-6 fats that tend to be more inflammatory, things like corn oil, soy oil, um, canola oil, or a lot of fats that have omega-6, and we can even find it in animal products. And then there are the saturated fats. And what I would say there as it relates to saturated fat is to focus on, you know, saturated fat has a bad name in nutrition. And I think that that has been um, incorrectly set up. And I think that really we have to look at the different types of saturated fat. Like saturated fat coming from coconut has a different property than saturated fat coming from uh, a beef steak. You know, completely different properties. They're processed differently in the body and they give us energy in different ways. What the studies show is that um, the brain can work off of those fats that are in coconut oil. So one of the things that happens as we get older, 65% of people are really afraid of losing their mental sharpness. So how do we preserve the brain? We give the brain alternate fuel that it can burn in the absence of being able to burn things like glucose efficiently. So the brain can burn what we call ketones or these fat breakdown products from things like coconut oil. So I do think coconut oil is great, but what I'm also seeing is that, you know, typically when we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when people think, oh, coconut oil, then it's coconut oil this and that and the other thing, and now we have coconut nectar and coconut butter and coconut milk and coconut yogurt, coconut kefir. So I think sometimes we get um, a little bit overboard and I don't think all that coconut can be good for us either. I think, it, again, it has to be within a balance and looking at extra virgin olive oil, which is also fantastic. In fact, it may be the olive phytonutrient in that olive oil. So people want to buy cloudy, kind of the, the unfiltered, cold pressed, you know, where it looks kind of like, can this be for real? This looks like a dirty olive oil, but it's actually a really good, healthy one. So that olive Polyphenols are fantastic for helping us with inflammation and also oxidative stress, two of the biggest culprits with aging. So murky olive oil, got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a big fan of murky olive oil and changing up the, the oil sources, the coconut, the olive, um, sesame oil is great too. And um, I even like clarified butter, which is also known as ghee, G-H-E-E can be great because those are a lot of those short chain saturated fats that you find in coconut too, even shorter ones. Carbohydrates, that's the, the other one, the, the C. Um, when I think of carbohydrate, I think that we're doing way too much. Sugar ages us. And I think the reason why so many people have latched on to the paleo approach or doing a higher protein, lower carb is because in the end, they have more energy, they feel more energized, they feel more vital. You know, and sugar wears us down. It, it gives us blips of energy, and then they just fade away. And um, in the end, we feel more tired and depleted and robbed of our energy. You know, I'm always focused on not just the physical properties of food and what they're doing, but the energetic properties. And sugar, to me, is a hog of our energy. It takes a lot from us with just a little bit in return. And it feels really good. It gives us that high. But in the long run, it's just z taking away from our energy bank account. And so in the end, it's only going to hurt us and really age us. People, in fact, people with type 2 diabetes, I don't want to evoke fear or anything in anybody, but if you have blood sugar issues, you have to address them. Mm -hmm. um, because even in the scientific literature, we're, they're talking now about how metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes are conditions of accelerated aging. Accelerated aging, meaning you are speeding up the process. And I've seen that with diabetics. They lose their cognition faster. They don't sleep as well. They've got all this, uh, many times if they're on the spectrum of having too much body weight, that means more inflammation because a lot of those fat cells, they like to produce uh, what we call cytokines or inflammatory markers in the body. So somebody that's overweight is naturally inflamed. So we, we just have to think about that. If we have blood sugar issues, that's one of the first things you should get checked out. It's so easy to check. You can check it on a daily basis if you wanted to. And it's one of the biggest things that age us. But I don't think it's all carbohydrate. I do think that fiber is a really good thing. Um, keeping healthy bowel movements is a really good thing for aging. 
because the more that we're constipated, the more that we're recycling toxins and toxins age us. And so people say, well, what's normal healthy bowel movements? Well, it's one to two per day. Um, you also don't want to have too many because then you start, um, that it must tell you something about whether or not you're absorbing nutrients then, right? Because if you're constantly defecating, you're, you're not absorbing. So there's that happy medium there. <laughs> I used to, when I first started in natural health, I talked about going to the bathroom way too much. And my siblings would call me um, a poopologist. <laughs> I'm like, you have to get comfortable with this because this is telling you so much about your body. <laughs> we are definitely soul sisters then because um, that's my conversation, even at the dinner table sometimes with my parents. How are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> Did you go today? <laughs> Did it float? <laughs> <Yeah>. Fiber. <laughs> what shape was it? <laughs> yes, I mean, there's the Bristol uh, school chart. You know this, right? Yes. Where it shows you all of it. Yeah. So it's important. And I don't know why we don't like to talk about it. It's something that's so core to our human functioning. And that's right. Yes. Constipation equals aging. Yes. I, it's horrible. Ask anyone that's constipated, and they'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> And especially with travel, with people traveling a lot, so what you know, you tend to see there is more constipation and traveling. I remember Dr. Pam Smith mentioning this one. She said that it, being in an airplane flying from Michigan to Oregon is the equivalent of smoking 200 cigarettes. Oh my gosh. In terms of the oxidative stress, 200 cigarettes just going across the country and not even all the way across the country. So then you couple that with, okay, all of this bombardment of stale air, oxidative stress, and now people get constipated because they're traveling and they're not on their rhythm. And then they're not sleeping because they're in a different time zone. So then their, their sleep patterns are off, which means that their eating patterns will be off. Their metabolism will be off. So I think for people that travel a lot, mm -hmm. this is not so good for your aging process. Doesn't it dehydrate you really badly, too, just to being in the plane? Oh, yeah. and, and look at what people are drinking and eating. I mean, I sit there sometimes and I pull out my chunky green drinks and look at me like I'm strange, but I'm looking at them like they're strange. Like, don't you know what's going on? Um, and, you know, I have this fantasy, Carrie, that um, all of a sudden I can get up in front of the plane and I can start lecturing everybody on nutrition because they're a captive audience and maybe they'll listen. <laughs> They can't leave. <laughs> they can't leave. And I can tell them all about that orange juice that they're sipping down on this flight or the, that coffee, that heaping coffee with all that cream that they're having or the alcohol that they're drinking. Or, you know, it's, it's so amazing. You think that the airlines would really capitalize on this idea of going healthy. Mm -hmm. um, it could help people make people more vital. I mean, maybe that's not wanted. I don't know. But it needs to be a very good thing. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Not to go too off a beaten path, but I believe there was something in your one of your Facebook posts that caught my attention. And I have the same challenge is you do want to jump in and save everybody because we know so much. And the more you know, the more you want to throw a life raft out there and go, what are you doing? Why are you taking this? I think you were watching somebody with some some diet drink or soda and Excedrin or something came across her. Yes, or, um, what was like Defeating the purpose here. What's going on? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, that reminds me because I was just at that same grocery store last night. It's like a Sunday night and you get to see what everybody's buying. And again, on that, the, um, the what do you call it? You know, conveyor. where everybody's putting their groceries. The conveyor belt. Yeah. yeah, the conveyor belt. I mean, the person in back of me, I, I just wanted to say something, but I just, yeah, I, I have to find that, that tender balance because not everybody wants to be pleased to. Not everybody cares about aging. Not everybody cares about their weight or even... But I just know that, you know, once you feel good, it's so hard to going, to be going back to not feeling good. It's almost like then that becomes the vitality that you just want to ooze out there to, so that everybody feels good because why should we feel bad? Mm -hmm. So it's not a righteous thing. It's more of, gosh, I just want to help. I mean, don't you want to feel better in your body kind of thing? And the woman that was checking out behind me, she was um she also worked at this grocery store and she had a big mound of candy and she was complaining to the cashier checking me out saying how she just couldn't stay on she wanted to leave her shift she had no energy and i'm looking at what she's buying and i'm thinking ah oh, <laughs> let's talk about energy <laughs> no kidding so. oh, it is it's we do mean our very best we do have a big heart <laughs> we don't mean to hurt anyone we just want you like you said to feel good know what it feels like to really feel alive 
yeah. I think everyone deserves that feeling in this lifetime. So that's why we do what we do. <laughs> I don't think that many people still believe that they can and feel like that for food. I think that there's still is this limiting belief that food is just something that we just eat and it has nothing to do with anything. And that's just really hard for me to grok. You know, that um, yeah, I think that's even the first message that you can empower yourself that every bite of food determines your destiny. We are the accumulation of the foods that we've eaten. So, but yeah, we, we're on the same page on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's not just about filling your stomach for the moment and, cur you know, curbing those hunger pains. It's so much more than that, um, by all means. So what other tips can you give us to aging gracefully, um, you know, on good choices? What's the best choices that we should never leave the grocery store without? <laughs> all right. Not candy. All <laughs> So I mentioned that protein, fat, carbohydrates, and also minerals, vitamins, and phytonutrients. I would say the biggest thing, Terry, is um, color. Color, color, um, and we don't get enough color. When we look on the place, and I don't mean the M&M kind of color. Mm -hmm. I mean the vibrant, glowing, radiant food color. You know, we look at that food and, and just feel that vitality coming into it. So when people were surveyed on what they were eating, what they found was that, guess which color was the lowest? Green. The green? A lot of people think it's green, but no, there are a lot of green food options. So that one actually is not as, as bad off. The one that people laugh the most, 88% of people laugh, is blue-purple. Mm. So we don't get enough blue-purple. And um, when I think of blue-purple compounds, the proanthocyanidins, they're very protective for the brain. They're very important for helping to reduce dementia and learning and cognitive difficulties. And so, you know, there are limited blue purple choices, but we're getting more. So what I would say is make sure that you have all the colors, especially that blue purple. So if you get the choice in the store to buy orange carrots or blue purple carrots, kind of the purple orange carrots that are available now, buy the purple orange. Are you serious? There's such yeah. thing as purple carrots. Where have I been? Have you seen that? <laughs> no. Oh my gosh, they have purple carrots now, but when you slice into them, they'll either be yellow or orange on the inside, but the outside is all purple. They're beautiful, and they're very dense. They're almost a different um, kind of a fiber structure than the regular starchy kind of orange carrot. You know, they're, they're much more intense in flavor, too. So go for purple. If you see um, purple cauliflower, go for that. You've seen that, right? Mm -hmm, yes. Okay. Purple kale, they have that. There are purple potatoes that people decide to do potatoes. Much better than that fluffy russet potato, go with one of the small Peruvian purple potatoes, which are low in glycemic index and full of phytonutrients. Uh, and then me living in the Pacific Northwest, I always go for berries, huckleberries, blackberries, marion berries, blueberries. And don't go for, the more skin that you have in the berry, the more dense that is in nutrients. So you want more skin to the inside. So that's why things like blackberries are better than a blueberry. Because a blueberry, if you stretch out all the skin, you have less than you would have from a blackberry. Because just think of all those little pods on that blackberry, right? If you took all of that skin, and that's where the phytonutrients are. That's where the protective compounds are. So make sure you get those. Um, if I think about the other um, plant foods, um, I would also think about, you know, in terms of orange, orange is, you know, just to think about blue purple and then shifting over, um, orange is also an incredible compound. Um, there are a number of different carotenoids, beta carotene, alpha carotene, beta cryptoxanthin, and we need those carotenoids, especially if you're concerned with your skin. So that's a big thing for women. Women think about their skin, especially if they start losing estrogen, when their skin starts to get very taut and um, doesn't really recover as well, what you do want to focus on are carotenoids, and carotenoids are these plant compounds uh, in all all plant foods, really. So, you know, in, in fall, where you see the leaves change, especially on the East Coast, right, of the United States, you see the leaves go from green, and then they change into perhaps yellow or red. Underneath the green, many times we have these protective carotenoids, and what they do, just like they are in the leaf, where they're embedded underneath, they are like that in our skin. So I have especially been very concerned about skin because I have very light skin, so I have to stay out of the sun, and I'm just more prone to things like skin cancer. 
So getting lutein, lutein is one of these carotenoids that is extra protective for the skin. And um, when we have enough lutein, it helps to hydrate the skin. They've actually shown that within two weeks of taking supplemental lutein, I believe it was at six milligrams per day, um, that you can maintain better hydration and that uh, people had better texture of their skin just in general. Got it. Six milligrams a day, lutein, better hydration. Check. <laughs> <laughs> I live in the desert. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> yeah, and you definitely want to aim for, for lutein. Absolutely. Uh, I love lutein uh, for that purpose. I take 20 milligrams uh, like every other day. You can find higher dose lutein. Uh, and what you'll notice is that for people that have very spare skin, like we do, um, you can even notice that the skin will start to, um, I wouldn't say darken, but it takes on a different, more youthful glow when people are doing lutein uh, with time. I notice that when I don't supplement, because, you know, essentially it's right there underneath your epidermis. Yeah. And it, it can change the, the color of your skin a little bit. Very cool. I love good <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> well, that's okay, <laughs> because through you, you're helping lots of people, so that's, that's great. That's right, that's right. Very cool, so purple carrots, huh? I have a 10-year-old daughter, so, and her favorite color is one of them's purple, so whatever helps her eat better. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, I always like to ask people the challenge of, and maybe this for your daughter, too, can you get the rainbow in one meal? Yes. One meal, you know, what does it look like? And, you know, maybe even put that out as a challenge to people, because that is a successful aging vital meal is when you've got all those colors right before you so you know what would that look like what would be your idea of a rainbow meal so i like to focus on color because we feed off of not just the phytonutrients but the vibration of color different colors allow us to feel differently so we all need to tap into what are the colors that make us feel vibrant um Carrie, for example there was a study that showed that people that selected the color yellow is their favorite color and more like a sunshiny bright yellow um, tended to be happier than people that chose other colors. So they synced up color choices with moods. Uh, and believe it or not, people chose gray. Some people chose gray, and those tended to be more anxious and depressed folks. Hmm. So think about the colors that we surround ourselves in. You know, um, in my previous house, now we have a lot of things painted yellow, but in my previous house, I had every room painted the color of an element that I wanted to sync up the energy of that room with. So in my kitchen, I wanted the energy of fire because I knew that that would evoke that psychological response. So I painted the, the walls um, kind of the sponge orange and yellow. And then in the uh, living room, I wanted earth. I wanted something calming and centering and grounding. So I painted it green. And it was, you know, again, it kind of like a wholesome forest green. It just felt so good to be in that space. So, you know, to think about the colors you wear, to think about the colors that um, are around you can affect your psychology. And when your psychology is impacted, your physiology, your body is impacted. Just the same way that when your body is impacted by something nutritionally, you change your energy, you change your psychology. It's a double arrow going both ways. So I do think that color is medicine. Color feeds us in more ways than we probably realize. I couldn't agree more. I'm a I'm a tranquil blue. Anything that looks like the ocean is my favorite color in the whole wide world. And you live in the desert. I know. <laughs> I'm from Michigan. I was surrounded by lakes. I swear. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's where home is. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up here. I was in route to California and I kind of fell short. <laughs> uh, maybe you needed some of the balancing of the, the dry desert and yes. the fire. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll get to the ocean one of these days. <laughs> one of these days. This isn't permanent. But no, I love that you're bringing in the spiritual side of that and the energy. Um, I know when I have a great salad in front of me that's full of many colors, there's fruits, there's veggies. I'm just, I get like vibrationally excited. I can't wait to eat it. And that's really how it is. Once you feed yourself the right fuel, your body can't wait to have more of it. Um, and I agree. Yeah, colors around us do change our energy for sure. Nobody likes to sit in a gray cubicle all day. I mean, think of how happy those people are. And they're not got their favorite colors around, how depressed the lighting is bad. You've got fluorescent lighting. I mean, that's that's majority of corporate America, unfortunately. And no wonder we're stressed out and freaking out. <laughs> so last night I walked my husband has his, his music room and I hadn't been in there in a while. And I walked in and I saw that he had three different colored lights. He had a yellow light. 
he had an orange light and then he had a blue light and it was really neat and i said mark you're giving me an idea i want to create like a room of just rainbow lights <laughs> for whatever my need is yeah. and um there are some studies also just looking at the calming effects of yellow light and, and having that in our environment and there are also studies that when we put a blue light bulb in our refrigerator it reduces our appetite when we open just think of it we open the refrigerator we see blue light it looks cold it doesn't look inviting even though you like blue i'm assuming that you would not like to look at blue yeah i think that would turn me off <laughs> <laughs> well and, and so it's just again the the impact of, of things like color i'm gonna have all my clients change their light bulbs to blue and they're trying to cut down on snacking so much <laughs> everybody change your light bulbs in your fridge to blue yeah. To turn off. I can imagine that not being so vibrant and shiny. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting aspect. So as we're wrapping up our wonderful time with you, um, I do want to let, and you might want to let them know too, Deanna's got a ton of free gifts. In fact, I was overwhelmed a little bit like, wow, there's a whole wealth of information in here from videos to reports to booklets, all sorts of wonderful things. She's got a whole library of free good stuff. And we'll include the link in there. Did you want to share any of that with the audience of what to expect? Yeah, so many different things. I, I think that probably the biggest thing that people like the most is the recipes. And we have a number of recipe packets. So all they're all free. You can just download them. Another thing that people might be interested in is something that I call the um, Nourish Your Whole Self Report. So this is how do we look at food in a more vital context? So beyond the average calorie and getting away from analysis paralysis and really changing up our relationship with food because how we relate to food is how we relate to everything else. And that's going to say also something about our vitality. So one of the things that will help us with aging is to start looking at things in a new way. And that's what this report will do is to help you to look at food from a color and an energy perspective. Not everybody is used to looking at food in that way. And so I feel like in the 21st century, we have to go energetic. We have to start looking at the microparticles, um, quantum physics, you know, the, the old laboratory markers of the day. I mean, that's all important and that's all good, but it's just a snapshot and we're constantly changing. Who you are right now sitting here is different than who you were this morning and who you're going to be tomorrow. So how do we capture all of that? How do we eat for the energy that we want to be? So that report will help you with that. And I also have just a number of other trainings and classes that I offer to really bring people down that, that path of transformation. And of course, um, books on my site as well. Chakra Foods was one of my first books, which is all about the energy of foods, everything that I'm speaking to. So, And I do believe that this is really the essence of vitality. How do we connect with our foods? Because that's going to say something with how we connect to our bodies, our minds, our spirits and who we are and appear out into the world as. I love it. Good stuff, guys, good stuff. Um, so that link is included in the body of the email, so go over there and find Tiana's website and all her goodies. So as we conclude, do you have any final thoughts for our audience that's looking to be vital? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would just leave with one phrase, which is uh, something I say a lot, which is, Eat the energy you want to become. So not that phrase, you are what you eat. I think it's more eat the energy you want to become. So if we're eating fried, shriveled up food that maybe tastes good, but you know the energy of that is, is really lackluster and it's not vital, then we can only become that. So what do you want to become? If you want to be vital, you need to eat vital. So, and also a big hug to everybody. <laughs> love, because love is... Love goes beyond everything else, of course. So um, also want to send that out to everyone. Yes. Yes. And make all your food with love, too. There you go. Two, kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very cool. I like that. I'm going to start using that mindset. Eating the, ener the food of the energy. The energy I want to be. I don't want to be a cheeseburger. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I always say you can't work off a bad diet, guys. You already did the damage. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's great. 
It's very true. Well, I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for being a big part of our series today and educating our audience. You've been a wealth of information, lots, lots of notes to take and keep track of, and um, I appreciate you very much. So thank you for being a part of our series. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks for doing this. People really need to have this information, and it's not just the information, it's the inspiration. And so thanks for inspiring everybody to, uh, to transform and be everything they are. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna.